Stockholm, can you hear me? Yes. Stockholm, are you already asleep? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good one. Okay. All right. That worked. Many beers here, which is good. However, that will hinder me a bit when I do the demo. All right. So, thanks for having me. I'm always very excited being able to share what we're doing in Apache Drill um, amongst people who are interested in that open source setup. And um, what I do at MapR is essentially um, looking at um, use cases, data sources, and so on, and helping people to um, utilize big data on, yeah, on a good, good scale. And um, today I'm here for Apache Drill. And on the one hand, I really like to get you up to speed what is going on there. And on the other hand, I'd like to, to get involved and to start being part of that movement. And now I would very much appreciate if my clicker would work. So now I overcome the hard part, which is setting up the laptop and working the clicker work. Everything else is pretty easy. Mm -hmm. The first question I typically ask in this context is, what kind of workloads, if you're looking in the enterprise setup, do you typically see? What kind of things do you have to deal with? Anything comes to mind? Any, anyone wants to shout out? Anyone with a beer in the hand or? How about batch processing? Right? Things like pig, hive, cascading, whatever. Typically, there are use cases like data mining or ETL offloading, whatever, where you would expect that uh, MapReduce-based workload is, is uh, seen. How about OLTP? HBase, Cassandra. So there are a number of use cases where that is really useful. Stream processing. By the way, Storm recently um, entered uh, Apache as well, so it's now an Apache project, or at least the proposal is there. Um, all kinds of, of uh, streams, it could be in the Internet of Things, um, you know, uh, sensor devices or whatever, or social media streams, and you need some kind of engine that is able to process these streams as they come in. Good old search and information retrieval, of course. There is uh, Solar, there is Elasticsearch for the cool kids, and uh, being able to uh, deal with any kind of structured, semi-structured, unstructured data. But what about the interactive analysis? If you want to, on an ad hoc way, query large heterogeneous data sets, any ideas? Anyone who has a suggestion there? Almost. <laughs> you're, you're right, um, to a certain extent. So I, I'd like to step back here a bit and say, uh, what is currently available in the sense of uh, deployed and, and uh, established. So you have things like um, Hive, you have things like um, relational databases where you can ETL the stuff you have in your Hadoop cluster into the relational database. Obviously, you're limited by the size that the relational database can handle. What we really want to see, and uh, a number of uh, efforts and, and activities are done around that, and some uh, people mentioned Impala already there, um, all, all of these projects, all of these activities, be it Drill, be it Impala, be it Citus Data, HeadApp, or others, really focus on giving you low latency. That's the thing where some analyst sits in front of Tableau, Datamere, Excel, or whatever, clicks and expects a response within a second or less, right? So that's not really what Hive can deliver, at least not today. Let's have a look at some use cases where that might be useful. Uh, meet Jane, she's a marketing analyst, and she's got a deadline, and uh, obviously the deadline is yesterday, and the manager says, give me uh, some target segments for a marketing campaign. The data might reside in different data sources, not very uncommon uh, for an enterprise setup. You might have transaction data in, in a relation database, you might have user profiles in MongoDB, and you might have some web logs click logs in a Hadoop cluster. And now the question is, how can you bring all these together? How can you query them where the data resides in situ? Another one, which is a kind of um, uh, remodeled uh, use case of one of our customers, imagine you have to 
um, track how suppliers are doing their performance and so on. You might have things like questions like how um, are the shipments from a certain supplier in a certain time range or from a certain region. And again, a recurring pattern there, you have the data in different data sources. On the left hand side, relation database. On the right hand side, bunch of JSON files, for example, logs. A third one where you see how Drill and Hadoop somehow build a, a synergy. You can imagine that this uh, heat map on the right hand side here is generated by, say, a hive uh, job, right? Generates these nice pixels, and each of the pixels might stand for a transaction. And the color encodes, for example, um, how high uh, the chance is that this transaction is somehow fraudulent. So you can imagine, and that's actually the case with, with that customer, human operators sitting in front of that map have a, a really straightforward means to detect there is something going on at this red area there, but then they need to verify this very transaction. And for that, you need something that allows you to, and that's not a pun, to drill down, to drill down exactly at that area. So you have the combination of batch mode that generates an overview, an aggregate, and then drill that allows you to drill down into one specific area. So what we learned from these use cases so far is what we really need to be able to do is being able to query different kinds of data sources, be it in HDFS or HDFS-based like HBase, be it MongoDB, Couch, you name it, um, be it relational databases, they will still be around for good. And um, that is a, a very basic requirement, right? You really want to be able to query the data where it sits. And this is something that sets Drill, that sets us with Drill apart from others that focus entirely on HDFS and HBase such in Pala. Um, you want also to be able to be flexible regarding the query interfaces. Um, in our case, we started off with SQL. However, you can plug in any kind of domain-specific language if you have Ruby or whatever you want as a scripting language. Obviously, low latency real-time is something, as I promised or, or hinted at uh, earlier on already, that that's an absolute design goal to have low latency. You also want ad hoc queries. Um, why are ad hoc queries important? So if you think about that, um, the knowledge about uh, what you're after changes, the requirements changes. That might happen from one hour to the next or from one minute to the next. So you need to be able to ask these kind of ad hoc queries in order to accommodate the knowledge you have. And obviously, this kind of goes without saying, the whole thing needs to be scalable and reliable, right? You want to scale out on commodity hardware. And now for something completely different. For the ones of you who are familiar with Google Dremel, um, you may grab another beer, go for a cigarette or whatever, it takes us five minutes. In 2010, the Google engineers released this Google Dremel paper. And they came up with two main innovations. Um, I highlighted some of the keywords here, scalable, interactive, read-only, multi-level execution, tree, column, and data, blah, blah. I will go to that uh, in, in greater detail. That is really just the abstract of this um, very nice um, paper that was published back then. But this is a paper, right? This is an, uh, a research paper. My, my background is also in, in academia. I led a research group. Um, I, I produced uh, and made people produce this kind of papers. That's nice. But what counts in reality is code, and it's something that you can run, that you can download, and that makes you productive and lets you achieve something. And let's have a look at, at what their innovations were, and then I'm going to tell you how we implemented that in, a, in Drill. Partially, as you can imagine, it's still work in progress. So the first innovation uh, the Dremel team introduced or, or published there was that of multi-level execution trees. And it's, very, it's a very complicated word, and they made it up. I try to figure out if someone else uses it out there. Good luck. If someone finds this word somewhere else, um, I owe you at least a bottle of champagne. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure they made that up. Uh, but it's very accurate. Why? Because it exactly describes what it does. It has multiple levels, and it is an execution tree. What it means is you have the client here that might be, in our case, Excel, Tableau, Data Me, or whatever. This is a BI tool or whatever, something that is able to send in a query. SQL in our case for now. You have a root server, which actually the role is to take on that query and to distribute it in the query tree. Then 
you have intermediate servers and you have leaf servers, those are the actual guys who do the real work. They look at a part of the data, query it, and report back the results to the root who then serves it to the client. Now, anyone, on, to make it a bit uh, harder, who has not or does not know the Dremel paper, anyone an idea why it makes sense that this is a, uh, actually a tree and not just flat? Second, distributed processing. Obviously, right? We want we want to do that with you know thousands of nodes. But I could have you know thousands of nodes here, up to over there, um, and just one root, right? A very flat tree. Why do we actually have multiple levels? Mm, yes, yes. Also, the main reason uh, really is is that of a fan out. If you think. If you have thousands of nodes talking to one root server here, thousands of RPC connections coming in there, that doesn't really scale. That, that root node quickly goes down. So what you really are doing is you're fanning out, you're spreading the load over multiple levels. And they also did some experiments to show what the optimal level is. The second innovation, um, and I want to talk about that in a bit greater detail because it's kind of pivotal to understand what is going on. Um, they came up with a way, uh, a new way to uh, transform uh, data which is tree shaped into data that is uh, columnar shaped and uh, using the columnar oriented um, data layout there. So everyone knows that. Even if you don't know, you're using it on a daily basis. That is the way how a relational database would lay out the data on the disk, one record after the other. Now there are databases, um, also relational databases, that do it column oriented. And if you look at that, it makes a lot of sense, in, in, at least for certain use cases, to store the, the data really column-oriented, right? Um, you can do things like a compression on the column. If you look at um, in the relational database world at a table that has 50 columns, and you really only need two that do something for you in, in terms of answer, that add to the answer, and you still would need to scan all 50 to them from this, you're essentially throwing away 48. And with that column of storage, you're essentially only reading the columns that add something to the, to the result set. Now, the problem is, what can you do if you have nested data? Turns out, Google, with protocol buffers, has nested data. So they needed to find a way, because they wanted to benefit from that column of representation, to turn that protocol buffer representation, which is a binary way, like JSON in binary, uh, if you're more familiar, there are Avro and Thrift, uh, open source uh, protocol buffer currently uh, as well. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a tree. And you want to create such tabular representations out of it in order then being able to apply the 10, 15, 20 year old columnar representation um, techniques on top of that. So that's the second innovation they came up with. Mapping, taking the schema, taking the data, and turning this nested data into columns. Of course, because it's a research paper, they did some nice experiments, showed and give you a bit of an idea how big it is. I mean, that was 2010, and they did, certainly didn't use the biggest production uh, clusters there, but it gives you a bit of an idea how big it is. And they also applied um, the, the Dremel stuff um, only on, on, so you see from, from the execution time here, um, pure MapReduce records, MapReduce with the columnar representation, and Dremel, which combines the multi-level execution tree with uh, the, the columnar format. And you can see you have always 10x here, um, how because that's log scale, right? How nicely that goes down. And uh, lower in that ca case means better, right? It's faster. And also, this was the other thing I mentioned earlier on the toyed around a bit trying to figure out how many execution levels are optimal, right? You would imagine that uh, the more, the, the, the better, or the, the more, the, the, the faster, whatever. But turns out that actually after two or three levels, um, it doesn't uh, gain anything. The, the, the administrative overhead in coordinating many more layers outbalances the, the gains you have there. So we, we typically would use two or three levels as well. Back to drill. So we have the key facts, what we know for now, inspired by the Google Dremel technology. We are aiming for SQL 2003 support. Uh, currently, not yet fully there, but as we speak, um, many more people step up and, and contribute. Um, 
The pluggable data sources concept is key to drill, being able to satisfy that requirement around being able to query different kinds of data sources. Nested data, obviously motivated and inspired by the Dremel stuff, um, is a first class citizen. And no matter if that's binary, like uh, protocol buffer, Thrift, or Evro, or textual based like JSON or XML, or YAML, if you want to use it. Um, schema is optional, so we don't require you to tell us what the schema of the data is. That sounds a bit funny. I'm going to show it to you later in, in, the, in the demo what that really means. Uh, of course, if you do provide the schema, if you have Hive, for example, using the Hive Metastore, um, HCatalog, for example, uh, Grill will obviously benefit from that. But if you don't, if you just say, here's some data, here's some structured um, data like JSON or whatever, um, go and, and figure out what the, the schema is, then we'll, we'll happily do that. And the, the most important thing from my perspective is it is a community-driven thing. It's not only licensed under Apache 2, but it is driven by the community. Although we in corporate map are put a lot of resources into that to drive that, uh, which is quite typical for, for an Apache project that uh, you need some corporate sponsorship behind it, otherwise it will die off. Um, it is really shaped and driven by the many people that are around that and contribute, uh, have a, a, a separate section on, on the contribution and how you can contribute if you find it as cool as I do. For now, let's stay on the technical part. So this is a very high level 10,000 feet view on drill. As I already mentioned earlier on, on the lowest level, we have different kinds of data sources that can be Hadoop based, but it doesn't have to be. And those are pluggable. So if you come up with a new, cool SQL, NoSQL, whatever database that seems to be um, quite fashionable nowadays to come up with new databases, um, you're welcome in, in drill. You write an a scanner, uh, according to the scanner API, and you can plug in your own data source there. I'm going to go into greater detail re regarding the, the inner workings in a minute. For now, I'd like to get your focus on that one. This is beside the, the usual stuff we have here. You have a REST interface, you have a command line interface, you're going to see an action in a moment, and a native API, which is Java 1.7. Um, we also have a JDBC ODPC driver, which means it's directly able to plug into whatever BI tool that speaks SQL. And still, the last time I, I counted, uh, quite a lot of them do that. So let's have a look at what is going on when we open up um, Drill, what is going on internally. And for that to work, I need to introduce some of these terms. You will hear them in the following. The source query, that's the original query, SQL, think SQL in that, in that sense. The logical plan, that is something we internally use to represent the query all the operators, the data sources, and so on. The physical plan actually is derived from the logical plan and tells how exactly we're going to do that. And the execution plan is essentially taking everything into account, uh, topology and so on, and tells essentially drill or the drill bits where uh, the execution is taking place. And how does that work? Well, really from left to right. A query, a source query, comes in here. As I said, for now we are focusing on that. A drill QL is a sub, uh, superset of SQL 2003. You could come up with Mongo QL. I, I'm not sure if an issue is there for, for that now, but if someone says, hey, I'm so into Mongo, I really like to keep continuing my Mongo QL queries there, fine, right? You just have um, to write a parser according to our parser API, and there you go. You can query drill with Mongo QL. Or you can come up with any kind of domain specific query language in Ruby or Python or any other Scala or whatever. Um, uh, language you'd like. There is the parser that translates this source query, as I said for now, SQL to logical plan, which pretty much looks like, anyone identified how that looks like? Yay, at least some people still away. Cool, that's JSON. Um, obviously, we're not serializing that. You, you can, if you want to, for debug purposes, you can serialize that, um, but this is, this is the, the way how we represent um, what is going on there in terms of what operators are used, what data sources are used, and so on. And through the optimizer, we create the physical plan and the execution plan. The execution really takes place at each of the nodes and takes into account the specific uh, of the data source. So if you have a relational database, we're trying to push down the query to relation database under the assumption that the relation database itself knows best how to deal with that query, optimizing that with an access or whatever. 
Any questions so far? So that's pretty much, if you've understood that part, then you know what real does. How, how does this, uh, how does, how does this get translated into an SQL query? It's actually the other way around. So it's the SQL query that comes in and the parser translates that into the logical plan. And the logical, that's actually the heart of, of drill. And we started out with that. That was the first, it was a Google Docs still there, um, design document that would actually describe each of the parameters like this one, right? Essentially says, here, this is a filter parameter. It takes these, uh, these arguments here, this is the return value, and so on and so forth. And based on that, which represents the query itself in an agnostic way. So it doesn't matter where the query originally comes from, what assumptions are here, but it represents it in an agnostic way. And that's actually the work of that parser. So there's the parser API. And if you come up with your own language or an existing one you want to implement, you would need to find these, what matches my, the semantics of the query here to the semantics of the operators we offer in drill there. Right. Right. So up, up to here we are fine, right? Okay. Then the optimizer takes things like the topology, it can be the format and so on into account and creates what we call fragments. So it, it um, already in the physical plan uh, can optimize things. It says, for example, oh, um, this bit, that's why the topology is important, this bit is actually in an HBase um, backend. So I can rewrite that part because here it just said filter condition X greater than three. But if you know that this is an HBase backend, you can rewrite the query and uh, optimize it and, and take advantage of the operators or fun functionality that this data source actually has. And then this part is, is uh, again, essential. I come back to that extensibility again, the scanner API that actually implements what a concrete data source needs to do in order to return that data. So it comes on and says, apply that filter. Well, that's different in MongoDB than in HBase or whatever. But again, the main point is scanner API, parser API, all these things are open and documented. So everyone is welcome to come up with their own. If someone says, I want to do MP3, I want to directly query MP3, well, you can do that. Right. Yes. Yes. It's, it's an interesting question and I would go so far that I would really want to raise an issue around that because I, I see, I had that discussion already in, in another context uh, and I think, it, I think it's worth noting. So we have not defined, um, you know, minimal requirements or profile or whatever, but it would probably be interesting to say this is the core set of operators, whatever you need to, you must support in order to, to be useful. But then again, it might be a bit uh, subjective then, you know, what might be useful for me might not be useful for you and so on. Uh, but I think it's worth it. Uh, I will I will take a note to raise an issue around that, which is always the first step so that we have it on record and we can, um, yeah, at least give it a try to, to come up if that makes sense and, and how we can, can approach it. And if you um, have any suggestions there, more than welcome. Right? That, that's one form of contributing actually, raising these issues, coming up with use cases and, and uh, situations we, or whoever is involved so far, have not been thinking about yet. That's actually a wonderful example. Thank you. So coming from that very high level and conceptual uh, thing now to a more down to earth and concrete view. And I hope that Wouter or whoever is around will remind me how I'm doing with the time. I have totally lost. I'm There's more than enough time. Uh, cool. Is it a brief question? Yes. Thank you for, for reminding me. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Um, coming back to that uh, wire level architecture. So our smallest unit of execution, if you want, is the drill bit. That is, in a sense, comparable to what you have in Hadoop with uh, a task or, or, or a job tracker, right? That's, that's what, what you have there. Um, and if you imagine um, each of, of these uh, rectangles here is a, is a node, so one server, whatever. Um, there is the drill bit running and there's the storage process running. And 
obviously we want to do as much as possible in parallel there, right? We want to query the data in parallel. All the coordination, the query planning execution, what I showed earlier on, that is done in a distributed fashion. However, at some point in time, or maybe we should uh, also mention that we are using a distributed cache, Hazelcast in our case, uh, for the metadata and locality information and Zookeeper, or better say, Curator, uh, Netflix put together this nice wrapper or package around Zookeeper, which makes it uh, way nicer to, to, to use um, for this kind of uh, distributed uh, communication and coordination. Um, but what I wanted to point out now, which is probably more interesting, is um, what happens if a, a concrete query is submitted? So one of these drill bits um, that can be by policy, that can be randomly, is selected as the format, so that the one that receives the query. If you remember back at the, the demo paper, that would be the root of the multi-level execution tree. And also to point out that all the da data communication here is done uh, in memory, right? So we're either communicating via Hazelcast, via the distributed cache, or via RPC. So unlike MapReduce, that always goes to disk, if you look at the, the output of the map phase, shuffle phase over the network, and reduce phase again, in drill, we always stay in memory. Of course, if you have, depending on, on your configuration, uh, you can always spill, that, that's always possible, but we try to stay in memory uh, by design. And what happens then, if you take this one um, node that has received the query, which is now the form and role, this multi-level execution tree uh, essentially is constructed via a zookeeper or curator. The membership information in the cluster is determined. They say, hey, who is available? And they say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here and I'm here. And this foreman's role is really to set up this distributed uh, multi-level execution tree to say, okay, you two are my intermediate and those are the worker nodes down there. Right? And then we have this tree and can happily process the query down there. This is really something that happens in the execution phase where we exactly know we have all the fragments. Yes, please. The question was how the tree is constructed. Um, currently, it is very much hard coded. Uh, the good news is that because it's pluggable, you can write your own optimizer. So if you have, find a very clever way to do that, you say, hey, I know exactly I have a multi-level adaptive algorithm to change that, then you can do that. Currently, it's very much static, very much hard-coded. The question was around um, failure behavior, so recovery and so on. Um, no, the, the principal idea there is um, a query in drill is so short-lived that it doesn't really make a lot of sense um, to trying to do a lot of, uh, you know, failing over this node and, and retrying stuff there. Essentially, for now at least, um, the idea is if something fails there, we'll just abandon that and restart the, the entire query. I mean, if you have a MapReduce job that takes 30 minutes, an hour, whatever, then the time is worth restarting it and trying to, to, to do everything again. Uh, if you have uh, five seconds or one second, uh, the, the management around that being able to recover parts of the query would outweigh way uh, if you compare it to just restarting the job, the entire job. For that one query? For the one query. Yes, it's always, sorry, I should have said that. It's always per query. So this tree, this is really for one query. It's not always the same drill bit. It's once a query comes in, this drill bit for this query becomes or turns into the foreman and all other nodes. It could be that in, in the same moment, um, this one is the foreman for another query and this one is the worker for another query. It's on the fly for one query, but during the query execution, it's static and hardwired. But you could, if you want to, in the optimizer, due to whatever reasons, I so far don't really know for a good reason, uh, come up with a way to change that, if that helps. Yes, please. Yes. 
Yes. Right. Right. Can, can, can we take the one question? I'm very bad at, at, at remembering stuff, especially after this wonderful beer. Um, so the first question is uh, really, um, what are the conditions under under which drill will spill to disk? And uh, this is pretty straightforward. If you think about um, the input data size, let's say 50 terabyte, and you have a query that is not very discriminative, you just say select everything where nothing, right? We have a, a query that essentially says return me everything. Um, that will mean um, drill will try to you know scan everything and return everything and it will essentially immediately spill. That's not uh, a use case for drill. I would argue that uh, you want to use drill especially for things where you have very specific queries. If you have if you think back on the use cases, you have, uh, they, they might be ad hoc, but they are very specific. You have um, very specific conditions, you say, uh, in this region or at this time frame or whatever. So the, the general design assumption is that the result set size, whatever those guys report up the, root, uh, the, the tree here, is compared, compared to the overall data set size, input size, small. So you would might end up with I don't know, a couple of terabytes here in the data set, and you might end up with five, ten hundred rows that are actually aggregated back then there. So whenever you have a query which is not very discriminative, you might run into that, um, and it's very easy to construct such a query, but that's the general pattern how, how, how that would uh, not make a drill usable or, or useful. Okay, second question. <laughs> Yes, yes. Right. Right, right. It, it obviously depends, as you already, uh, as you pointed out, uh, on, on the type of, of joints, what, what, what kind of joints you have there. Yes, yes. So the question was if, if joints are supported, and yes. Not every kind of, of join uh, is yet supported. We're working on that as well. It is, in fact, uh, as you say, it is uh, quite a challenge. I'm not entirely sure what, is there an echo or it somehow sounds, sounds weird? Maybe I, I should stay over here, right? <laughs> that's, the safe, that's the safe area. Um, there are, I, I know some of, of the guys in the, in the BigQuery team, uh, at, so BigQuery is the, the public offering of, of Dremel uh, that, that Google has. Um, and what, what I know from, from the conversations there is obviously they have, um, you know, uh, advanced the system and, and, and uh, have new things in there. And I think, I'm not entirely sure, I wouldn't to, to validate that, that uh, BigQuery now also offers uh, joins uh, directly. So, um, you know, that was 2010. It's essentially the same problem with, with uh, what you have, I mean, the, or if you look at the original Hadoop papers, 2003 and 2004, uh, what happened since then, uh, Google certainly <laughs> made advances there. So you wouldn't be able to say, okay, uh, um, this was 2010, they said no joins, and this is still the case. Um, in our setup, in our design, there is no inherent reason why this cannot be done or shouldn't be done. Um, we are aware of the fact that there are reasons, especially the lack of people implementing it, uh, why this is not available today. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, there are, I can show, show you some uh, joins already now that, that, that work. Um, it gets more complicated the more data sources are involved, obviously. Yes. yes. And the third question, Alex. Yes, yes. So this is something I thought, oh, I have it in, in one of the next slides, um, that Besides the fact that it's community driven, which really sets drill apart, all of these things are customizable. And uh, okay, two or three slides. So give me a moment. Um, and and UDFs are, are one part of that of that nice picture. So this is essentially it: uh, the drill bit uh, that receives the query, um, distributes it in the, in the query tree. All of these guys do their work, report back the result size, the uh, result set, and that's it. It's very simple, very straightforward setup. Um, taking into account the type of query, obviously. We have not reinvented the wheel for many things, and as you can see, there are many, many 
uh, open source components we're uh, yeah reusing in, in drill, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy and, and proud of, of being able to, to say that uh, yeah, we we'll make good use of that. Especially pointing out these two things that are not that old yet, Parquet and ORC or ORC. Uh, Parquet, I come to that, you will also see it in the demo, and uh, ORC or ORC, um, which is the new version in Hive of the, the optimized uh, RC file, um, somewhat uh, compatible or, or uh, from design perspective, um, the same idea is what you find in the in the Dremel paper with the columnar uh, storage. So summarizing that, full SQL, nested data, first class citizens, schema is optional, and the extensibility points. Now I come to the UDFs. So for each of these points here, you have the, the possibility, and we strongly encourage people, and we've seen people already doing that, to you know, extend drill, to adapt drill to your own needs. That might be something not sure how you know popular this feature will be, but that you can plug in your own uh, query type. Um, UDFs, as we know from from Hive and PIC, uh, are quite popular and quite uh, necessary. You can come up with your own ser serving tree or or former uh, f format or topology there in the in the physical plan. And I think, at least in my understanding, this might be the most useful and and uh, I would expect that most people will jump on that part because they have their own data format they want to do. They want to do some kind of video or whatever kind of, of data source or data format. Um, so I would expect that this part is really the most interesting part for people to uh, adapt drill to their own needs. We also have a number of user interfaces, as I mentioned already earlier on. Um, this is the one part I'm working on uh, currently. So we have the REST API almost there. Um, it's not part of the current release, but in the next release, and I hope to have a preview uh, of that. So you essentially fire up your web browser and can directly uh, query that, not using the command line, but uh, via, via the REST interface and having that uh, web UI. Uh, Front-end developer under you might recognize, yes, it's based on Bootstrap. Right, time to get our hands dirty. So. The purpose of this part of the presentation is really to encourage you to do exactly what, more or less, exactly what I'm going to do there. I can vouch that this part really makes sense. Not entirely sure if you really want to wait for, I think it's some 50 or 60 megabytes to download that, but believe me, you can download it. Let's directly jump into this part. Does that work? Can people see that okay? All right. So where's my cheat sheet? Um, one thing, so after you've downloaded it, right? So you, I assume you got that binary um, from there. And although the official release, we're currently in the voting phase and whoever is familiar with Apache knows that there's a bit of bureaucracy and so on, just use the binary one unless you want to build it on your own. And then you just download it, wget, curl, whatever you prefer. Uh, tar it and, and you have it uh, in, a, in a folder of your choice. So that's what I have here, right? That's it, yes? 20 minutes, great, wonderful. That's perfect timing. Um, actually, I'm here. Actually, I'm here. So that's when you un untar it, that's, that's what you get there, right? You have a bin directory, conf directory. Actually, we can have a look at that here, right? That's the full Monty, right? You have the bin directory, conf directory, People who are familiar with Hadoop obviously know these things, and config, and so on. Also, this drill bit pretty much reminds us uh, of Hadoop start and so on. Okay, so the first thing you want to ensure is that you have um, Java 1.7. So I would say half or more of half of, of, of the people who start with uh, drill uh, encounter that issue. They have still 1.6, and yes, Hadoop is 1.6 based, will change hopefully soon, but still you, you really want to make sure that you have 1.7. Drill won't work with 1.6. You have to get 1.7. Depending on your system, there are different ways to get that, but I trust that you manage that. Um, and you also want to probably set the lock directory. Right? At least I figured that macOS, the, the wire lock doesn't really work, so I set it to the, to the current working directory. Fine. So we assume that this works, right? 
Let's see, drill log, yup, that's there. And Java should be 1.7, right? Yep. So that's actually all you have to do. You get it from um, this URL, you tar it, untar it, and um, you're good to go. And the first thing you want to do is you want to start the drill bit locally, right? Let's check with JPS. Yep, there's the drill bit, right? That's the big drip it. Yes. Oh, 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 thank you for pointing that. That is not good. Ha ha, that's better. Thank you. I owe you a beer as long as they are here. <laughs> um, anyways, so you, um, you made that drill bit start. And now, whoever knows Hive knows pretty much what I'm doing now. I'm starting an interactive shell. I'm telling Drill that I'm going to use um, a schema or the data format Parquet. Parquet came uh, from Twitter. Twitter essentially figured that they need to do something about the way how they handle uh, their data and uh, essentially figured that the way the, the Google engineers described it in, in Dremel with the Colmer, the nested Colmer format, that this really is the way to go. So if you go to parquet.io, you find everything there. It's in GitHub. Uh, a lot of nice tools around that you can you know create it read and stuff and uh, we have prepared in that release uh, two example files right nation and region per k um, so i told drill essentially um, with the sql line which is part of one of the open source components we use um, optic um, and essentially said okay look i'm gonna i'm gonna query a parquet source and uh, now let's let's use a simple query there right and here you already see what i meant by can you see that by that drill doesn't really know um about the schema in the first place because you still see these underscore map so this is a pseudo function that uh, essentially maps all the fields that it finds there and of course you can always analyze it you can say say, you know, to that underscore map, our region key as region key, so you can in subsequent uh, selects or whatever, you can use it as region underscore key. And uh, so this is what, what uh, Drill does there. Obviously on a single node, uh, not very impressive, but you can imagine if you have that in a distributed setup with uh, distributed um, data sources that this uh, certainly uh, will decrease the, the query time. Um, there are a lot of log uh, messages there still. That was a count, as far as I've seen it. Yep. And this one, oh, yeah, that's, um, oops, that was fast. And I think I promised Adam a join, right? We have some of them documented here. As you see, there's still a lot of things in terms of documentation that we need to get right. Again, a little hint. If, if someone wants to chime in and help us here a bit. Um, this, this one is really going to be fun. Never tried this one. Oh, probably I shouldn't, I shouldn't use it that way. All right. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I think that is much better. Okay. Let's see. Okay, fairly, fairly fast. Um, so this is really, it took me, of course I have all the dev stuff there, but uh, one part of this um, release process, uh, especially in the incubation phase, is going through a lot of bureaucracy, which means uh, we put something together and then everyone uh, in the community is, there is a vote where people, you know, download it, try it out and say, yep, that works or that doesn't work or whatever. And literally that part took me, I think the, 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 the longest part really was downloading the stuff, downloading the 50 or 60 megabytes. The rest really, you know, was that straightforward. And this is just to motivate you, go and give it a try. It's a matter of uh, yeah, half a cigarette or, or half a coffee or whatever. And, and uh, you can go and, and have fun with, with drugs.
Obviously, the next step um, now is, is the cluster. Um, we have not yet, uh, in the binary release for, for, for the milestone one, we have not yet uh, activated that, uh, but it's there. So it's in principle there that we can do it in the cluster. And the next thing I'm going to work on would be, um, and actually, I'd like to get a bit of a feedback if people would find it useful. I plan to do an uh, EC2 deployment where we have, I don't know, three or five nodes where drill with some data sources is pre-configured and create an, an AMI uh, that people can use to recreate that. Who would, if you consider testing out, test driving drill, who would consider that being useful? Is an AMI useful or is that something people say, what is that AMI? <laughs> One, <laughs> two, three, four, five. You convinced me, I'll do it um, after another beer. Um, just some mentioning some of the resources that you find useful, and uh, I'll share this, these slides right after after the talk now today, so you can directly click on that. There is the Getting Started uh, guide. I was not entirely sure if it's already included, definitely not in the in the um, release candidate three. Uh, currently at some GitHub of, of one of the contributors there. There's the uh, demo. I already showed you that. That's this one in the wiki. It's quite detailed or verbose. Whatever, but it has pretty much everything in there. Um, we should clean it up, uh, addressing developers and users a bit better. That it's clear, you know, if you're a developer, this part is relevant and so on. And also, one of the contributors put together uh, special installation instructions for Ubuntu. And if you want to do the same for whatever other operating system or flavor, um, let me know. Now, sorry. Uh, if you execute the query and it yes. takes a lot of time, can you yes. monitor the execution going on or cancel it? Or... Yes. So um, there is the, can you do it in theory and can you do it in practice? Currently, I couldn't demo, I wouldn't be able to demo, you know, and here is a hook or here is a whatever uh, port where you can hook into and, and show that. It is there. You can do that. Um, it's possible to cancel the query, of course. Um, the question came up already in another hug uh, in the sense that we have a, a dedicated administrator view, especially if you think about you have a deployment where you have, I don't know, uh, 20 or 100 different uh, users there that submit queries and you want to maybe say, okay, these people, you know, these are, I don't know, the business people, so they should get more or less whatever. So, you know, uh, they, they, their queries should run on faster hardware or whatever. Um, but, um, we're not there yet. So it's, it's certainly something, I'm pretty sure there are two or three issues there I could point you at, so it's recorded, we know about that, um, but it's it's certainly not something you can already use now. Right? But again, if someone uh, would take care of that part, that would be awesome. A lot of people would benefit from it. Coming to, well, be part of it. So there are a number of uh, organizations, and, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say that MAPR is, is certainly the driving force, and, and we've founded the whole thing in Apache. Uh, that contribute to that, some 100k uh, lines of code currently, and the, the demo I showed you is available from Red URI. As you can see, release candidate 3 and uh, release candidate 4 is being voted on and, and it will be the official release uh, source only. So I pointed out three uh, RC3 because it has a binary, and we decided for the, the formal one that will be published um, only having the source, so you would need to have Maven installed in order to build that. Uh, but I thought it's a bit too much for, for five or ten minutes demo to, you know, Maven tends to download half of the internet, so, yes. It would be a wonderful use case. I am unsure if with, so it pretty much depends on the data source. With stock HDFS, you wouldn't be able to do that, obviously, because, you know, it's a pen only, you can only, um, so, it, depending on the underlying data source and, and, and uh, what, what you use there, it would be possible. Um, the, the one problem you would have is in order for, so you would essentially need reliable snapshots because the data set cannot change uh, during the time drill is executing that, right? Drill does not, drill is a query engine, right? It doesn't take into account data that flows around or whatever. It just says, okay, here is some data I'm querying. Uh, if it gets a chance to push that down to the database, find that it's the problem of the database or data store, whatever you're using down there. Um, but 
the, the design assumption behind that is you have a kind of fixed view on your data. So if you have a file system that allows you to take a reliable snapshot of your data at a certain point in time, I could imagine that you're streaming in the data, taking a snapshot and querying drill exactly on that snapshot, yes. But that's not possible with, with uh, Apache, with, with stock Apache. Too. A number of people, and I'm pretty sure I forgot someone there, that have been contributing so far, and we have a nice page that, that lists people um, on, on our incubator page, um, just to, to give you an idea from all over the world and all over, from all over the place, uh, people contributing to that effort. Talking about contributing, how can you help if you think that's a good cause? Um, it's not only code, right? For example, myself, I code rather little. I do the web UI and other things, but uh, uh, I do things like outreach. You, know, you can talk about that. You can write uh, documentation that can be, you know, on, on your blog. You, you write about how you used drill in a certain way. You can, can, can come up with use case scenarios, uh, as you just said, right? Um, is it possible to do that on streaming? If you would flesh that out a bit, say, okay, here I have these data sources, and th that's the way I would envision or would wish uh, to, to be able to use drill, that would be wonderful, right? The more people come together and say, this is what we want to do, the better at the end it gets. And last but not least, that's the last minute, engage. There is Twitter, there is the mailing list. Every Tuesday at 6, uh, your time here, we have the, the Google Plus Hangouts, and there is a, a blog around drill, it's called drilluser.org. Update every now and then to kind of summarize what is going on. And um, in that sense, I'll leave it here. Thank you very much.